Uh, good morning. My name's Phil and I'm one of the pastors here at Campbelltown Baptist Church. Now, it's a privilege to be able to come here this morning uh, to read Jeremiah chapter 29 with you. And before we do that, uh, to help us understand a little bit of the context, I'm going to read Psalm 137. So if you've got your Bibles there, open to Jeremiah 29, put a finger in there and flip over to Psalm 137. And uh, let's read it together. Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There on the poplars, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? If I forget you, Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. May my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not consider Jerusalem my highest joy. Remember, Lord, what the Edomites did on the day Jerusalem fell. Tear it down, they cried. Tear it down to its foundations. Daughter of Babylon, doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Will you join with me as we pray? A gracious and loving Father, please, Lord, we ask that you might meet us today in your word, that you'd show us something of your love and mercy that you have towards a people who are so, so easily led away from you. Please lead us uh, closer to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, some 14 and a half years ago, when Fiona and I started ministry here at Campbelltown Baptist, um, I started doing some door knocking around the Claymore area. I don't know if you've done any door knocking, but let me encourage you, if you have a chance, um, then do it. Uh, know that the fear will disappear when the first door opens. It's a good uh, rule to remember. But as I was knocking on doors in the streets of Claymore and meeting people and uh, finding out a little bit about them, there was a question that was asked of me uh, regularly through all the, throughout all those visits. And the question was this, what did I think of Benny Hinn? Now, Benny Hinn um, is a bloke in a, in a bad suit with a bad message. And to summarize it, for those who don't know, basically it is to give so you can gain. And so essentially what it meant was that you would give $10 to God and God would repay that by, uh, by tenfold. So you would give God $10 and he would give you 100. You give him 100, then he would give you 1,000. You might ask the question, who do I give money to? Well, the answer to that is quite uh, simply Benny Hinn Ministries. Now, the thing that struck me was that they weren't questioning Benny Hinn in a bad way, they loved him. They loved seeing the stadiums full of people, seeing people throwing away crutches and throwing off their wheelchairs, saying no to medicine and saying yes to the healing power of Benny Hinn. It captivated a need that, that resonated within their hearts. But that captivation wasn't only just in the people of Claymore, but it was also in the congregation of Westside in those early days. There was something about Benny Hinn's ministry, however peculiar, and I don't go so far as to say dangerous, that captivated a need within people's hearts. And that need was for hope. Hope that somehow things would be better, things could get better, that life could get better, that God indeed would one would be one who would reward their faithfulness, would reward their ten dollars, and in response give them a hundred. Now it's just not a a, a message for people of Claymore that Benny uh, pronounced, but a right right around the world, the the poor and the rich were captivated all those years ago by his message. Because I think deep down, we all long for hope. We all long for, for God to look into our lives and then miraculously or amazingly 
suddenly make our lives better, to intervene in such a way that we would go from good to better, or from bad to better, that God indeed would somehow give us something uh, to help us um, during this life. Now, what we have before us in um, Jeremiah chapter 29 is a situation that is very similar, where the people who are in exile are longing for hope. They're longing for God to intervene in their lives in a miraculous way so that the exile might be over soon, that the pain that they're experiencing, the grief of loss might be healed and that they might be restored to their families back in Jerusalem. Well, God, in his love and in his mercy, sends a letter to, of hope to a people who are powerless and hopeless. And chapter 29 centres this letter um, in a surprising way on how his plan is unlike anything that they would hope for or expect. So again, if your Bibles are open, then please turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. And we'll read just the first, um, the first couple of verses. Jeremiah chapter 29. Now this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. Now what we see here is a people who have been taken into exile. And life is hard. Psalm 137 has given us a little window into how hard their life really was. But as we've been going through the book of Jeremiah, we see that this people have brought this exile on themselves because they have refused to believe the warnings that Jeremiah has given them, that God has spoken to them, has pleaded with them to repent and to turn their lives around, to get rid of the idols, to get rid of their, their plans and schemes, their political alliances with the nations around them, to surrender it all and trust wholly in Yahweh, the God, the covenant God of their forefathers. And all through this time, they have failed to do it. Now, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25 is the halfway point in the, in the book. Up until that time, we have Jeremiah uh, fulfilling the duty of his ministry of uprooting and tearing down. He has shown the whole of the structure of society has become corrupt with not just the idolatry, but the injustice that has pervaded the court system, the judiciary, the, the rulers and the, those who are in power. From the top down, the whole place is rotten. Rotten because of sin and hard-heartedness and rebellion against the covenant God who loved them and brought them out of Egypt so that he would be their God and they would be his people. The people in Jerusalem and Judea have thoroughly rejected, um, rejected Yahweh and instead have followed after other gods while holding Yahweh at a distance. In chapter 25, as the halfway point in um, the book of Jeremiah, we see that the date if, um, is 605 BC. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had just defeated the Egyptian army in Carchemish, and the political alliances that Jerusalem had, had made with Egypt was their safety blanket. And when Nebuchadnezzar defeated the Egyptian army, suddenly all of their securities were taken away. All of their political arrangements have fallen so that they now stand vulnerable to the Babylonian army. Whereas before they felt that they were impregnable, now they were exposed. And that's why the exile has taken place. They have failed utterly and completely. Now in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 30 through to 33 is a book of consolation, of hope and of restoration for the people of God in, in, in Babylon. 
that God is saying that there is hope for them in the midst of the exile. Now, in between chapter 25 and chapter 30, we come to the section where God's, um, where Jeremiah, God's prophet, um, is waging a battle against the false teachers and the false prophets and the false priests for the hearts of God's people. And it culminates in chapter 29, where God, through, um, through this letter that Jeremiah writes, writes this letter of hope to a people that are utterly powerless, who are grieved because they have been torn away from Jerusalem. They've been torn away from God's promised land. So what do we see here? Well, if your Bibles are still open, then please look with me at who has been uh, shown to be part of the exile. Well, what we see is the the surviving elders and the priests and the prophets. Now, these are part of the religious elite of Jerusalem. These are the ones who represented to God's people, God himself. They were the ones who organised the sacrifices. And these are the ones who ignored and stood against Jeremiah. In chapter 2, what we see is the king and the queen mother and the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem. The political elite, a part of this exile community, these are the ones who God, through Jeremiah, begged to repent, to heed the warnings, to not trust the armies of their neighbours to, to protect them, but to trust Yahweh himself, the covenant-keeping God of Israel. And again, they failed to do that. And lastly, we see um, identified as the skilled workers and the artisans who had gone into exile as well. These are the tradesmen, the craftsmen, the ones who um, who built temples and shrines and idols. These are the ones who would have fashioned out of wood and stone the idols that people would have bowed down to. These are the ones who made the votive offerings, the incense that was burned in the high places. Now, in the midst of all of these people, we see God's faithful being woven in the mix. Um, for those who know the book of Daniel, we see this period being described quite wonderfully of Daniel and his friends being, um, being carried off into exile and serving the, the king Nebuchadnezzar. Um, for those who have read Ezekiel, Ezekiel and, um, is there in the midst as a prophet of God calling his people away from sin and away from idolatry, but to put their faith and trust in the covenant-making God of Israel, Yahweh. So in the midst of it all, we see while there is some faithful people woven in amongst them, this group of people have been responsible for the exile happening itself. These are the people who have said no to God and yes to just about anything and other, anything else. And these are the people who have been exposed. These are the people who have had their, who have had the, the, the power to, to change the destiny of Israel. And yet they have refused. So what are we to make about these people? Well, do they deserve to be here? Well, I don't know that they do. But what we see here is not their goodness on display. Rather, we see the mercy of God. We see in this um, in this in the opening chapter here that in chapter in verse four we see that these are the people who God has carried into exile. He's carried them. Now, the idea of Nebuchadnezzar carrying them and God carrying them uh, are two different things. But God has actually shown mercy to these people who have rebelled directly against him, who have thrown their fists at him and have done the worst of things. They've let injustice run. They have caused orphans and widows and aliens to suffer. They've led the people astray through their idol worship. And yet in the midst of it all, God who is rich in mercy, 
is showing love and mercy to them. Now, one of the things I'd like you to, to make a note of is that in verse 4, what we see here is the, the name of God is Lord Almighty, the God of Israel. What God is, is um, revealing here is that the Lord Almighty is the God of hosts, the God of armies, that he is the one who is directly responsible for the situation that the people find themselves in. He has waged war against his people. And, but not only that, being the God of Israel reminds the people of who they are that he is the God who has called Israel out of darkness into into his light to be his special people. And so when we look at this opening section of, um, of Jeremiah's letter, we see both the good of God and his judgment against his people. So let's continue. As we move on from the context of the um, of this letter, we see the instructions that God has called His people to do, and these instructions are quite beautiful and wonderful as we read them. In verses five and six, we see this picture of a normal life. Make your life here is basically what He's saying. You see there, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce marry and have sons and daughters and wives and basically increase. Build your family, build your wealth, make Babylon your home. It must have stung uh, for the typical uh, Jewish person at this time, because how are they meant to do this? Their history has been, has been formed that this place is a dangerous place. Remember, Abraham was called out of Ur of Chaldees into the promised land. Ur of Chaldees is the same area of Babylon. And as Abraham leaves Ur of Chaldees to go to um, the promised land, in the promised land he learns what it is to be a man of faith, to trust God with the whole of his life, to trust him with his safety and security against foreign kings, to trust him in the midst of uh, of um, holding to a promise that God indeed would give him this land and through him all the nations of the world would be blessed. You see, Palestine was the promised land which God had given his people so that they would be a people of faith and their hope and their love was based in that land. But now had the exile and them being brought to, to Babylon meant that now they were in a dangerous place. See, when Abram was there looking for a a bride for his uh, son, Isaac, he said to Eliezer, don't go back to where I came from. Don't go back to Ur. Get a wife for my my son from one of my relatives. Now, why was that? Because Ur of Chaldees was a dangerous place, a dangerous place for faith. So don't be there. And where are the people of God? Where are God's people here? They are in this dangerous place. So what are they to do? Well, do this, God says. Settle down. Build life. Enjoy life. Delight in life. Because this is the place where I will grow you to be a people of faith. Not in the promised land, but here. But then verse 7, God ups the ante for his people. See with me what he's caused them to do. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. How do you do that? Imagine for a moment that you are one of the characters in Psalm 137. As the tormentors come and say, sing us a song, because you're, the, you're the, uh, the songsters, aren't you? You're the people of the song. You're the people who have got all the songs. So sing. 
and in your heart you're breaking because you know what their army has done to you and your family. How do you bow the knee and pray for them so that they might be blessed, so that they might prosper, so they might grow with you? How do you do that? Well, at the end of verse 7, they are told how to do it. Pray to the Lord. Pray to God about your situation. It sounds easy, doesn't it? Now, lots of things in the Christian life sound easy. Read your Bible. <laughs> that sounds easy, doesn't it? Pray. It sounds easy. Give yourself to the work of God Read in sharing the, the good news about Jesus. That sounds easy. There are three things that most people find incredibly hard, incredibly difficult, because if it's done on our own strength, then we just can't do it. You see, one of the things that God is calling his people to do is to be a people of faith in a foreign land, to trust Yahweh when all hope of returning to Jerusalem, at least in the, in the, in the near future, has disappeared. In fact, what we see that they are called to do is to wait 70 years, 70 years before God will call them to leave Babylon and return to Jerusalem. Now, that's a long way, long time to be away from your home. That is a long time to be away from where your heart is, where your desires are. That's a long time to be in a land that not only is suspicious of you, that hates you, that mocks you, and that holds you in derision. And if you don't, if you if you look at if we look at this together, what we can see is that God has placed His people to be a light to the Babylonians, to reveal the wonders and the mercy of God to them. Something which is, seems impossible at this point of time. And one of the great things about the Bible is not only does it show us what God wants from us, but shows us an example of how it comes about. And what we have during this time is people who are God's faithful servants doing this in their midst. We've got people like Daniel who are courted, oh, sorry, who are in the court of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And we see his faithfulness, his blessing not just of King Nebuchadnezzar, but those people who would seek to do him harm. It's a beautiful picture of, of what God's people can do in the midst of a pagan society. I wonder what God might do for us as we sit and work and live in a pagan society. But even more than that, what we see that God wants for his people is to prosper. That's uh, repeated there, isn't it? If the city prospers, you will prosper. If the city has peace, you will have peace. Again, that seems strange because Jerusalem is the centre of their prosperity. Jerusalem is the centre of their peace. But Jerusalem has been torn out of their hands and there is no hope for them to return to that place of prosperity and peace. You see, it's not what happens to, our, to us externally. This is what God's teaching them. This is not what happens to us externally which matters, but what God is doing in and through us. We might be in a, in a difficult place. Australia is becoming more and more secular. The, it feels like our freedoms are being impinged. But you know what? It doesn't really matter because God is wanting to work in and through us to bring peace and prosperity to the people around us, not so that they are rich and powerful or anything like that, but that they might know the wonders of the Lord Jesus through us. And as the people here will go through hard times and suffer, it will be through their suffering that they will reveal the way to peace the way to Yahweh, 
the way to be prosperous under his hand as they rest in him. It sounds great, doesn't it? But nothing that God has set about, um, that God has set up um, is not without challenge. Look with me at the next verse, in verse 8 and 9. We say, Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They prophesying lies to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. You see, the challenge of false teachers and false prophets in their midst. And it's interesting to, to reflect on what these people were doing. You see, in, at the end of verse 8, these dreams that you encourage them to have. You see, what we have here is that these people who have been taken to exile have wanted good news in the face of bad. Imagine for a moment that you had cancer and the doctor had the diagnosis of cancer before him. And instead of saying, you've got cancer, they said, don't worry about it. It's, a, it's the common cold. Oh, you feel relieved, don't you? You feel good. Your fears have subsided. But is it the truth? What these the ex, people in exile were doing is that they were going deliberately to false prophets and diviners and wanting them to be lied to. No, 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 don't worry, everything is fine. No need to worry about that strange lump. Everything is perfectly as it should be. Keep doing what you're doing and God will reward you. God will take you back to Jerusalem. In the chapter previously, we see this being worked out between Jeremiah and one of these false prophets. And if you've got time, then read that and see how it works out. But even more than this, it reveals the heart of those who have gone. You see, these people still are not trusting that God, that God is, at the, is responsible for their exile. They think that God will do a miraculous thing and bring them back into the land. And God's mercy for this people is reminding them that, no, I have done this. Don't look anywhere else, but trust me in this. You've got 70 years, so trust me. It's not always easy to hear the bad news, is it? It's not always easy to give the bad news either. But God has called Jeremiah to give both the good and the bad. And this is what he's doing here. The good and the bad news need to come hand in hand. One of the things that we have in the gospel, in the gospel of the Lord Jesus, is good news, don't we? We have the good news that our sins are forgiven. We have the good news that Jesus died on the cross and rose again so that we might have new life. We have the, the good news that one day he'll return and restore this world and everything will be great. But the bad news of the gospel is that you are a sinner, that I am a sinner, that our friends and family are deserving rightly of hell and God's judgment. It's not easy to say, is it? It's not easy to warn people. But if we don't, then aren't we just like these diviners, these false prophets, who only give the nice part of the story? Now, I think, Campbelltown Baptist, I think we as a church are really good at building bridges into people. We are really good at making connections. We are really good at sharing the love of Jesus with people. But I wonder if we become a bit like these false prophets and diviners when we only show the good. We don't press hard the situation that they are in danger. Our friends, our neighbours, our family are in danger because sin is separating them from God's love. Their hearts are in rebellion. They don't want to follow God because their hearts are chasing other things. We are dead in our sin. We are rebels at the core. And yet God in his love has rescued us. My friends, it's easy, isn't it, to bring the good news. 
But I think one of the lessons we can learn from Jeremiah is that we also need to bring the bad news as well. The bad news that they that that people are in sin and need God's love to save them from judgment. Now, that's where the people are. <laughs> and God's plan is to change them in a foreign land. And then he gives them this word of hope. See, with, look with me in verse 10 through to 14. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you to, back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Not only are they called to rest, but they are also called to look forward to. And this is what hope is, isn't it? It's a looking forward to what God is about to do. And what is he about to do? He's about to restore to himself a people. Not only is, um, is Babylon meant to be like the promised land for them, but it's also a picture of God bringing them back from exile into a, a new promised land, a renewed promised land. And this is described as my good promise to bring you back to this place. You see, to seek God with all their hearts, they're going to have to trust that God indeed is good, that God's promises will come to a, a, a point of completion, that these promises will, be, uh, will come to bear and that their lives of captivity, their lives of being a people without hope, will be enlivened by this hope. You see, the expectation is that for 70 years they will count the days. They will say one day closer, one day closer, one month closer, one year closer. That they'll count the days in expectation of what God will do for them in the midst of being built as a people again. Now, the book of Daniel uh, gives us a great picture of, of what happens. And what we see in Daniel, in chapter 9 of Daniel, is that he sees this letter and then he goes, oh my gosh. He makes a count and realises that the 70 years are up. And he takes this letter and he prays. And he becomes the you in verses 12 through to 15, uh, through to 14. He becomes the one who confesses the nation's sin. He is the one who stands in the gap and pleads for God's mercy and pleads for his restoration promises that God would gather his people back together and that they would be a people again back in Jerusalem, back in the promised land. It's interesting that it's Daniel who does the praying. It is Daniel who does the standing in the gap. It is Daniel who's the one who, um, who God speaks to and says, I will do this. I think in the book of Daniel, what we're meant to see is that he is the one who, who seems to be the only one who prays this prayer. But in the midst of this prayer, God honours it. And so begins the, um, the restoration of God's people back into the land of Canaan. And it's good for us to stop there and to consider, consider how God's plans and purposes are being worked out for us. You see, in 1 Peter 2, Peter paints a picture that is very similar to what is happening here for the, um, the people in Babylon. We see a situation where, where God's people, where God's people, us, are in a foreign land. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Sorry, two, sorry, 1 Peter, chapter 2. Uh, Peter writes this. 
He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. My dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits us. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it, of who we are as God's people. We live in a land of exile. We are a long way from home. Now, it may not feel like we're a long way from home. We live in a world and a society where comfort reigns supreme, where it is good to rest and relax. It is good to build our families and it is good to wait for Jesus' return. But I wonder whether we've become too relaxed and too comfortable. It's interesting to think that when we read Ezekiel, sorry, in Ezra and Nehemiah, so few people in Babylon, God's people, Jewish people, end up returning to the land. There are very few people who have counted the days when they get to go home. I wonder how we are going with counting the days. Do we have the, our eyes set on the goal where one day we will, we will meet Jesus face to face, whether that is when it, on the days of our death or whether that is when he returns? Are we counting the days with longing that that is where we are heading, that God's glory awaits all of us who know and love Jesus? Are we sold out for him? Or are we living for something else, for comfort and for ease? Are we wanting an easy way back? Or do our lives reflect that our hearts are set not here, but there, as we wait for that final day? Well, as we finish, what I'd like to do is to ask you to pray with me. And as we pray, I'm going to ask that God might change our hearts so that we too might be a people of hope because we are a powerless people. We are strangers and exiles in this land, just like the people that Jeremiah writes to. And yet we have a far greater hope of restoration than those people have, that one day we'll be restored to be with Jesus forever and ever. Will you pray with me? Uh, gracious and loving Father, we thank you that you are good in all of your ways, that your plans and your purposes are right and just and good and proper. Well, please, Lord, we pray that you would make us hungry for heaven, that you would help us to live life here lightly, that you would help us to serve and love the Lord Jesus above all things, so that the people around us might see you and see you in us and wonder at your graciousness, your love and your mercy. Please, Lord, we pray that you might be honoured in our lives. Lord, please, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.